Hello again, everyone. Dr. Vincent Lau here coming at you from Western University Critical Care Program alongside Dr. Robert Arnfeld with another point of care ultrasound hemodynamic series case. Uh, the next couple cases in the series will uh, delve primarily into valvular assessment and specifically in this case six, uh, we'll be looking at uh, measurements of a dimensionless index for cerebrotic stenosis in patients with a uh, low cardiac output state. So please check out the westernsono.ca website prior to delving into the POCUS hemodynamic series as a primer to understand how to uh, determine stroke volume. So delving into the cases, female with abdominal pain, NYD, uh, with pain out of proportion to exam findings, who's found to have a lactate of 7.8. She's sent to the CT scanner for an abdo pelvis and is found to have mesenteric ischemia for which general surgery takes her to uh, the OR for a small bowel resection. Despite the small bowel resection, her lactate still remains uh, mildly elevated at 4.4 and she's on broad spectrum antibiotics of Piptazo. She's brought to the ICU post-op by anesthesia because she has ongoing uh, hypotension. Her known uh, past medical history is that she has severe aortic stenosis from before with an EF of 20% and atrial fibrillation. Her systolic blood pressure is 80 around 50 still, heart rate 70s in a sinus rhythm currently uh, with a rest rate of 24, setting 96 on room air after being extubated in the PACU and temperature otherwise in febrile. So getting to the POCUS questions at hand for the sonographer at the bedside, was this ongoing septic shock primarily from the small bowel resection from ischemic gut? Was there a hypovolemic component? We did not find out how much uh, blood loss there was from the OR. And was there a cardiogenic uh, component given that the patient has known EF of uh, 20% and severe aortic stenosis? Was there a role for pressors or anatropes? And we'd want to get a good volume assessment as well given that the patient is uh, so tenuous from a heart failure standpoint. So getting to the images themselves, so having a look at the lungs, the patient primarily has A lines uh, with sliding lung indicating no pneumothoraces, no B lines seen here. And in the lower lung fields, we see curtain sign, no uh, pleural effusions, and no consolidation. And this is repeated throughout the right side as well. So getting to the images themselves, in peristernal long axis, we see no pericardial effusion. We see a severely depressed left ventricle with some heavy calcification of the aortic valve and the mitral valve is not opening up very much at all. There is no significant MR here that can be seen in this view, although we are perpendicular to flow uh, for the Doppler, and there's no AI. In a parasternal short axis view, we see a globally hypokinetic, severely depressed left ventricle at the papillary muscle level. Apical four chamber shows again a severely depressed LV. The RV free wall is not well seen, but as well the RV uh, systolic function looks uh, depressed. We throw color across the mitral valve when we see some mild to moderate MR here. As well on the right hand side, we see some tricuspid regurgitation, probably mild as well on the right hand side. So here we see the right-sided lesion of tricuspid regurgitation with a continuous wave Doppler over top of it, and we're using the calipers to measure out a peak gradient uh, to estimate an RVSP. The RVSP is a calculation of the peak gradient uh, regurgitation as well as the right atrial pressure, which can be estimated either by uh, a central line or by looking at the IVC in terms of its descension. Having a look at the IVC, it's on the smaller side of normal uh, with not a lot of respiratory variation here. And we'll see this better in M mode. As illustrated here, the IVC goes from 1.51 to 1.77 centimeters, indicating a normal size IVC but on the smaller side and uh, some mild respiratory variation here. Look at the apical 5 chamber, again a heavily calcified aortic valve, no AI to note here, and the patient will soon have an LVOT uh, pulse wave and a continuous area across the aortic valve to look for aortic stenosis. LVOT diameter is 2.01 centimeters, and we do our pulse wave right before the aortic valve in the LVOT, and we notice that the LVOT a VTI is only 12.2 centimeters, and the Vmax is only 65.3 centimeters per second as opposed to our continuous wave across the aortic valve, we see our VTI jumps up to 59.7, almost four to five times an increase in VTI. And the Vmax is also increased four times to 282 centimeters per second. So this indicates a tight, tight aortic stenosis, and we'll explain the dimensionless index uh, to you in further slides. 
But as to note, uh, the peak gradient here, max, is only 32 uh, millimeters of mercury, and the mean gradient is only 15.9 millimeters of mercury. So th based on the peak gradients and the peak uh, velocities alone, that this would indicate only mild aortic stenosis. But as we know, in a low cardiac output state, we can't use peak gradients and mean gradients to estimate the severity of aortic stenosis which is why I will explain both the continuity equation as well as the dimensions and index to you. So again, for our cardiac output, we have a VTI of 12.2 centimeters, uh, which we plug in here, and an LVOT diameter, which gives us only a stroke volume of 38.3 cc's per beat, which is quite low. And given that the patient's still in sinus rhythm at a heart rate of 70, that gives us a cardiac output of only 2.7 liters per minute. So given what we know, how can we optimize this patient's uh, hemodynamics any further? Uh, we know that the patient's currently not on vasopressors right now, and we wouldn't want to increase afterload, given that the patient already has a known uh, low ejection fraction of 20% uh, with a severely depressed ventricle and uh, severe aortic stenosis as well. So we wouldn't want to add on vasopressors at this time. Uh, in terms of cardiac output, we could optimize stroke volume as well as heart rate. We know that the patient has A-lines primarily as well as an IVC, which is on the flatter side of normal and with some mild respiratory variation, which could mean that the patient's uh, volume tolerant and hypovolemic uh, given uh, the recent OR that the patient had. So we could add some gentle IV fluids to see if that would improve uh, hemodynamics. In terms of contractility, we could increase inotropy for a severely depressed uh, LVEF, and we know that the stroke volume is also low because of that as well. Uh, so there could be a role for uh, inotropic agents. And the patient also has a relatively low heart rate at 70, so uh, increasing as well chronotropy, an agent that would do both inotropy and chronotropy, would be sought after. For those of you who have reviewed uh, Mark Tuchka's and Rob Arnfield's uh, westernsunno.ca advanced echo handbook, this will look familiar and that uh, we can assess uh, aortic stenosis uh, with uh, peak velocities looking for a moderate lesion which is 3 meters per second or a severe lesion greater than 4 meters per second. But as we know there are limitations and caveats to this. Uh, this is an exhaustive list here but uh, we'll primarily focus on in our patient that the patient has uh, LV dysfunction and that it may lead to uh, lower peak velocities and lower mean velocities and so we should use caution when interpreting EFs less than 40 percent. Mean gradient is the same thing again based on uh, AHA or ESC uh, guidelines uh, these ones are uh, AHA uh, that the patient would have mild uh, aortic stenosis if they had a mean gradient of 20 to 30 moderate if 30 to 40 and severe if greater than 40 but again, with a poor cardiac output and low ejection fraction, uh, caution has to be made in terms of uh, interpreting aortic stenosis uh, with mean gradients in this context. So looking at this table, which is AHA and ESC guidelines in regards to um, classifying aortic stenosis, we know that using jet velocity and the mean gradients is not applicable in this setting given the low cardiac output uh, and uh, the patient would have a low ejection fraction. So therefore, we're going to go into the continuity equation whereby we calculate the aortic valve area. And the next thing is the uh, velocity ratio, also known as dimensionless index. So the continuity equation that's shown here, and it starts out fairly simple, it's A1 times V1 is equal to A2 times V2, where A1 is the LVOT area, V1 is equal to the VTI, or the velocity across the LVOT, A2, which is equal to AVA, or the aortic valve area, which is what we're trying to calculate, and V2 is the velocity across the aortic valve. So finally, after doing all the math, the AVA or the aortic valve area is equal to this formula shown here. So it does get a little bit more complex after uh, plugging it into the math. So given the uh, slightly increased complexity and the math that's involved in calculating an aortic valve area for gradation of aortic stenosis and low cardiac output states, is there a faster, more efficient way of getting at this answer? And yes, there is. The dimensions index is named such that it's a ratio of a velocity over velocity. Seen here, the velocity VTI across the LVOT divided by the VTI across the aortic valve. The dimensions index can then be gradated based on its severity as well, uh, from mild, moderate to severe. So getting back to our patient, the dimensions index uh, calculates that the VTI across the LVOT was 12.2. 
and the BTI across the aortic valve was 59.7, which gives us a dimensionless index of 0.2, which is in the severe range, uh, as indicated here by this velocity ratio, is less than 0.25. So based on the POCUS hemodynamic findings, uh, the recommended actions to the team were that uh, IV fluids be uh, gently given uh, for A-lines on the lung POCUS and an IVC which was low normal in size with some mild respiratory variation. Uh, we asked the team to wean the patient off propofol as it was a cardiac depressant uh, postoperatively and only go with PR and hydromorphone uh, for pain uh, post-op. Inotropic and chronotropic agents uh, were also suggested in regards to uh, furthering and uh, improving uh, hemodynamics and stroke volume. Dobutamine was suggested as it was less inodilatory uh, than norinone. So in case somebody this female post update one from the ischemic gut resection was started on dobutamine at 10 mics per kilo per min, heart rate increased to 90s and uh, therefore the uh, systolic blood pressure also went up to 120s and the patient was never on any vasopressors or afterload increase. The patient received gently one liter of uh, Rainier's lactate uh, for IV fluids and the central venous saturations got better from 40s uh, percent to 70 percent and the patient was eventually uh, weaned off propofol and extubated. Uh, after extubation the patient was eventually weaned off uh, dobutamine as well and started back on heart failure medications. So thanks once again for joining us for our POCUS hemodynamic series with myself and Dr. Robert Arnfield. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please join us again in the future for further valvular lesions that we'll be going over in our next case series. And please visit the westernsano.ca website for uh, any screencasts in regards to primers on stroke volume determination. Thank you very much and have a nice day.